while we incorporate the mandatory training, uh, we also would take a step further and include a professional obligation to the profession and our professional obligation to, uh, to the subjects that we might be dealing with. And what I mean by that is that while we will uh, engage in the use of force training, while we engage in the use of force training, uh, we also take it uh, to the next step and uh, where we have to render aid uh, if a subject gets injured uh, or all officers are trained in first aid, CPR, uh, defibrillator, and uh, if, if any scenario uh, exists that somebody is injured, we automatically render aid to make sure that the person is taken care of. Uh, our, our ultimate uh, goal for, for the shift is to get ourselves home safe, but also to get the subjects that we interact with safe as well or get them uh, get them to where they need to uh, go on. So uh, we do things like apply tourniquets um, to uh, injured subjects or in injured officers. Um, and we ensure that our officers are trained in um, duty to intervene or duty to intercede. Uh, if they see something that does not fit the situation, they have an obligation, a moral, ethical, and really legal obligation to intervene and uh, put an end to that behavior or interrupt that behavior. Uh, so uh, everything is taken care of properly. Uh, so while we do the mandatory training, we, we, we try to, to take it a step further and uh, add on some additional training that will benefit uh, hopefully our officers and our residents. Well, thanks, Chief. Uh, I'd like to hear from members of, of the clergy who are very distinguished gentlemen who were here today. Uh, I and I, I'd like to start with, with Pastor Carter. Uh, and any concerns, either pastor that you may have or that members of your uh, church have concerning police use of force, we more than glad to, to try to answer any questions or concerns you have. Um, there are. First of all, uh, thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to to be a part of this event. That there are two areas that you know, as I as I talk to people. Um, that continue to, to come up to. One is, and this goes maybe a little bit before the use of force, but it's connected. And that is just trying to develop a culture of trust between our law enforcement and the African American community, um, which involves more than tactics and maybe against peace to culture and philosophy. And so, um, the question just had to do with how to improve that relationship before a use of force is even, is even necessary, which may influence the use of force if that culture is dealt with. So that's that's one general area. Um, the second one has to do with whether or not there, if there's an effort to hire ethically diverse um, law enforcement to reflect the communities that they serve. Those two major questions. I can I can only speak for my office. I will ask the chiefs they can address those issues as they pertain to us. But as you know, uh, Detective Supervisor Pat Laguerre has been our key person in community outreach for the last several years in developing programs and reaching out uh, to the community. So I'm going to ask him to, to comment on, on those efforts. But before I do, I'll just address your second question briefly about recruiting. <laughs> when I started as county prosecutor, which was in 2012, one of the first things I noticed in the office was a lack of diversity. Um, and that concerned me greatly. I did not think that our office at that time reflected the, the community. And I undertook a, a concerted effort to try to, to change that as much as possible. To some extent, we are uh, subject to whoever applies for jobs in our office, and, but also we do have outreach to, to other areas. So for example, uh, my chief of staff at that time who preceded chief of staff Felicia had previously worked in the Essex County Prosecutor's Office for 15 years as a deputy chief retired. He had contacts in Essex County, and he actively sought people that we ultimately hired. Some of them were directly through his efforts, and some was word of mouth. 
So I can actually talk to, to with Pat Lanier, who came from East Orange, who was one of our first of what, five officers. We have five of our detectives, uh, several of whom are working the major crimes unit under uh, uh, Chris Shelmore supervision, who were hired by us from, from East Orange. And some are African American, some are, are not. But I think it added to the diversity of our office by having those detectives who worked in an urban environment come out to Morris County. And it's, it, I think it helps uh, us deal with, with the, the community in a, in a, in a better way than, than otherwise. I don't know if I've said that sure. particularly or not. But Pat, why don't you address that, please? So part of my duty is I'm in charge of bias crimes, recruitment, and community outreach. So a lot of times we're always sorting out different minorities to come to the prosecutor's office. We're constantly filling out resumes, going through the interview process. For the most part, as far as hiring, there's a process. You have to go, you have to complete background investigation, drug tests, and we have to make sure we follow all the guidelines for hiring. However, going back to your previous question, how do we get to a point where we have that dialogue before use of force um, happens. One thing we do, we train officers and we talk about in different community outreach programs, which we I've told numerous kids, find out who the community officers in your neighborhood, introduce yourself, find out who the cop is, or have the cop on the beat, get out the car and speak to the community. Because once everybody knows the officer working in the community, and the officer and all, all the kids, a lot of times that minimizes the use of force. Now, a lot of times you have use of force dealing with vehicles, more vehicle stops, that might not be somebody in the community. So it's kind of hard to gauge, but one thing I would recommend is, like I tell every kid that we talk to in county, introduce yourself to the law enforcement officer, say hello. Because now when that officer knows who you are, every time they see you, they want to address you. And you wouldn't have, that many issues happening. Does that answer your question? Do you want to address that at all, Chief, either of the Chiefs, in terms of your your towns? So we're on Western Morris County. Sure. Uh, a little bit different there out there. It's a more affluent community, but the moment we started going back before I became Chief, putting officers back in the schools. Just because of the makeup of town, it's like you could have a house and then there's 10 acres between another house. So we don't get to see our kids. We really didn't have a Main Street. When it was Chesterboro, I wasn't really allowed to go into Main Street and talk and walk. Get out of the car, talk with people. It doesn't matter who you are. And now we're in the schools. Our SROs are establishing relationships with these children. And guess what? It's expanding onto us that they, well, I know this officer, I know that officer. And we get out to talk to people. It's great. I encourage my guys to get out on Main Street talk to people now because otherwise where do you start this you don't want to go into a war or go into battle with somebody you don't even know right it's all about communication and to me and sometimes communication is the moment of all evil people don't want to talk to each other what are we going to do um my hiring we have 23 officers i have um one female officer one spanish officer and we just hired an african-american officer and but you know what these are the people that are creating the crop they rise up they come out to us my newest officer is magnetic. It's great. I love it. You know, but it all comes down to talking with people at the end of the day. You know, and then who wants to work in certain areas? Sometimes we're bound on different counties, and different towns pay a different amount of money. And everybody's on, well, let me go here because I want to make more money. Again, the trust, going back to that trust, that's where it all starts. You know, I was raised a little different. You treat everybody with respect, and hopefully they will treat you. So, um, regarding the uh, uh, recruitment uh, for the diverse uh, police force, uh, we, we seek out a normal application route, but we also seek out uh, different minority organizations and specifically email them or mail them letters saying, hey, listen, Long Hill Township is hiring, and they're interested in sending them our, our way. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do. Uh, we've also uh, heavy, heavy involvement with community uh, policing. Uh, Prosecutor Knapp was, uh, 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 he joined us in a, 
in a meeting actually including the attorney general as well uh, and it was regarding an uh, immigrant uh, uh, population in our community it's really a church that caters to the latino organizations or the latino community and uh, they had some concerns and fears over some things that were going on uh, politically and uh, prosecutor and i've been the attorney uh, general uh, Rewald came down and met with the community uh, to let them know that listen we are on the same page we're here together we're here for you which put that entire community at ease the, the fact that i was able to make a phone call and uh, get everybody down there uh, was absolutely phenomenal um, additionally myself and uh, prosecutor knack have been on multiple interfaith uh, dinners interfaith gatherings uh, which uh, again creates that bond with lawyers so if you're if you're responding after an incident you're, you're kind of late there. and so what we said you want to be proactive you want to get out there and, uh, that's kind of been the game plan all along hopefully everybody else is doing that reverend scott do you yes. have questions or comments well, i have two questions i know the previous administration there were issues but not yes sorry um <coughs> having a discussion with the previous administration in terms of the a low number of persons of African American descent, Hispanic descent, applying for the job. Have you noticed that as a continuating process? I don't. I don't think so. Okay. I think that we have increased the number of applicants that we've gotten. I know that that uh, our chief of staff actually is involved in the hiring process, and we've had, we've been interviewing. Uh, Several minority candidates of late, as I, I think, you want to speak to that, uh, Chief? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> lately, we've just uh, interviewed uh, one Hispanic female, uh, a couple of uh, African American males, coming predominantly from the Essex County area, as it turns out. Uh, not to my credit, um, you know, it's a good office to work for, obviously, but a lot of it is through uh, word of mouth, uh, detective supervisor. McGarr certainly gets around and, uh, and, and spreads the word. Uh, generally speaking, our applicants uh, do know uh, somebody in the office already. So it's 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 putting the word out that we are looking to hire and getting good experienced people. Do we have any other avenues of communicating the possibility of hiring higher potential opposed to word of mouth? Do we have any other avenues? Yeah, there, there are a couple, there are a couple. One is that we have an intern program uh, where we have uh, men and women from colleges and law schools who work uh, for us uh, to prepare for a career in law enforcement if that's what they'd like to do. And oftentimes they become hired first as support staff members and then ultimately become uh, uh, detectives. So there's, there's a procedure. We also go to different job fairs. I know Patrick's gone to, I don't know how many job fairs at different colleges. You want to give an example of some of those? I know. So we participate at majority of the colleges in the area within a 30 mile radius. And we give out information on internships for college students, legal internships for law students. And we give out employment information for us, whether it's detective, whether it's support staff. One thing I encourage a lot of the kids to do in a lot of different functions we go to is participate as an intern because our office has hired, we have about maybe 10 individuals that's currently detectives in our office that started out as interns, support staff, and then hired as detectives. So we have internships in our office that goes year round, and we've hired a lot of our interns. So I, I usually push that out throughout all our college fairs. But if I do a speaking engagement at a school or at a church, I usually let the kids know that we have internships here. I want you to apply. Anything else? Uh, not, not about the okay. hiring. Okay. We've got the spotlight. Okay. Uh, my other question, um, and this is to Police Chief Willibur. Everybody here. Police Chief Willibur and um, Naga. Yes, sir. What types of incidents would necessitate the use of force, gun, or taser? I want to say taser, it is allowed right now. We do not have it. And, and the reason why that's a question, um, I've been asked 
Why does the police officer always have to shoot to kill? Why doesn't the police officer shoot to injure? You follow me? So the question is, what types of incidents would necessitate police officers using the taser versus the gun? I think every officer is going to start talking in the police officer presence. When you start when you arrive on the scene, then the constructive authority being there, trying to cause this verbal de escalation to bring the subject down. Hopefully, we can talk this out. 95% of the time, I would say right now, every situation that we get into, we can talk about. Okay. Right? That can be talked about. There may be a few incidences that we arrive on the scene and something, there's somebody being actively assaulted or not forbidden. An active shooter situation. I don't think we're at the point at that point we're past that. We have to move on and we may have to use force. Officers are allowed to use one level force higher than is being used against them. Right? So if you're hitting me with a stick, I may have to hit you with a stick, or may I have may have to pull out my gun, holster my gun, to get you to comply. And I don't think any officer in the state of New Jersey wants to use his firearm on somebody at the end of the day. Because of the you know the mental and emotional trauma that they're going to be with too, and that they're going to be fraught with that. Their family's going to be fraught with that. I don't think they want to be here now, but they know they have a duty to uh, protect everybody. So just to reiterate, as far as deadly force uh, and when when an officer can or, or should, right, uh, the the training that we receive mindset that the officer has to have is that it has to be an imminent the key word is, is always imminent threat of danger imminent, imminent threat of death to uh, to either the officer or to uh to another another su uh, subject so if somebody pulls out a gun and they're getting ready to take somebody else's life you can't under those circumstances say well let me see what tasers are going because ultimately you have a, a an obligation there's a liability you got to save that person's uh, that person's life so uh, the, the key word in a lot of our trainings is, is imminent or immediate threat, uh, most likely, or, or death. And that's, that's when you can engage with the threat. Reverend Scott, just to mention uh, tasers, I know this is a popular topic, and there are all tasers are in a group of what we would call less lethal methods. They used to call them less than lethal, now it's called less lethal. Because there have been instances where those devices, whether rubber bullets or taser or beanbag or whatever, could, although not intentionally, could cause serious injury or even death. So they're treated currently under our uh, state's uh, use of force uh, policy, basically the same. Basically, as I understand it, and I'll, I'll defer to, to Benny Leo to address this because he does some of the training, uh, but on the instance when you can use a, a taser is basically the same when you can use another deadly deadly force, whether it's a, a, a firearm or otherwise. Uh, and that may be something that needs to be addressed. That may be a very good point for for this use of force policy. Um, as, as Chief Wolfer indicated, not every department has tasers. Uh, first of all, they are they are expensive. Number two, there there's additional training that's required on the taser. Uh, before an officer can be certified to, to have what we call uh, conducted energy device, taser is a brand name, uh, they have to be certified. They have to go through a special training course just on that device in order to, to carry it. I don't know, Benny, if you want to address this at all. That's, that's something that the device needs. It's only certain individuals or certain officers are trained on that. Not every officer can just be handed a device they go out and carry. It's a specialized training, and there's only a handful of officers that do get that training. Uh, but it is less lethal than the deadly force. So Chief Naga mentioned the imminent danger. The imminent danger is in you, know, you have facts and circumstances that you receive from dispatch as you go up on scene. But uh, that imminent danger isn't the same as instantaneous. So if it's a report of a man or a woman with a gun, that imminent danger is there. And if you see that gun, that imminent danger is there. Uh, and it progresses until that weapon is no longer in that per person's possession or it's been seized by an officer. Uh, so it's not instantaneous. Uh, the, imminent could, the danger could be there, but that reaction 
to someone drawing a weapon on an officer may not happen in five, ten minutes into the altercation. So um, that's the difference there. But the devices are less lethal. Uh, you can, it's, it's considered under the mechanical uh, force, such as your ASP and things like that. That officers use before they have to get that done. I think there was an assumption, at least by the general public, that all police officers have tasers. That is an assumption. Yeah, that assumption. Oh. Yeah, there, there may be there may be departments where that's true. Uh, it's not true in Morris County. I don't think it's true in, in most departments in New Jersey. It, it's a specialized training. They have to receive, as I say, they're expensive. Not all departments uh, have them. Uh, one thing you did mention is why why don't officers shoot to to wound as opposed to kill? The way that the officers are trained, and again, I'll defer to the experts. Is you know, I'm not I'm not a firearms uh, expert, but the way they're trained is to aim for center mass, uh, and that is to stop the threat. That's the goal is to stop the threat uh, and to, to to fire that way. Um, and I can tell you that there are varying degrees of proficiency in firearms. Even the, the most proficient don't score 100% when they fire. People miss. It's, it's, it's not unusual for that to be the case. I forget, what was the passing score for firearms? Uh, to, to the eight? 80. 80. So out of 100, uh, you know, that's a passing score. Uh, maybe that should be increased. I don't know. That's an option, something that maybe. Uh, should be looked at, but you know, just you have to also deal with. And I'm not a police officer; these gentlemen are. But the stress of a situation, you know, may be such that uh, it's not always easy to hit the target you're aiming at. And you know, I, I again, I'll defer to Chief Wolf and Chief Donovan. We do qualify twice a year, so I have no qualifications, and that includes either a 50 round. 60 round force, and normally we can shoot two of those forces. That's just for daytime qualifications. Then you have a nighttime qualification, which is 40 rounds. The officers are, my officers do, they are 15, and they also shoot with shotgun, train on shotgun. So, you know, we have different little, you know, little areas where we may have to reach out if we had to with an AR 15 if there was an active shooter situation. Sometimes people are coming in nationwide now with more firepower than we have at that point. But a shotgun, I Basically, out there in Chester, we might have to be taking care of wildlife. Uh, coyotes or foxes or victims, bears, they're everywhere out there. Uh, but yes, we are taught for center mass. And believe it or not, in a stressful situation, even the most experienced shooters, I think, are good luck in the target 30%. Mm -hmm. So now, if you're going to add somebody moving to it, moving, that's just going to tell you your percentage is going to go down at that point. So, yeah. and then we also do. Quarterly or two other times a year, we train with the AR 15 for familiarization. Because if you don't know how to use the tool, forget how to use the tool. So we use that all the time, four times a year, the officers are, if they have AR 15, are training on those weapons. And so they become proficient in it. They know what, what, what it does and how it acts. We do, uh, we do incorporate, uh, I'm sure the Chief Over does the same thing, we do incorporate uh, grenades, uh, you know, shoot, no shoot scenario, which uh, I know some. Uh, some members of the union get uh, the opportunity to go to a uh, simulation type approach and see how that works. But we do a shoot, don't shoot just to get the officers training that just because you have your gun out and there's an opportunity to shoot, if that changes, you can holster your weapon and go hands on. So we bring in uh, outside uh, training uh, agencies to uh, to help the officers get through that uh, because you have adrenaline going, you have somebody possibly sending rounds your way. Um, you have different scenarios that present itself. So just because you took your gun out uh, to give somebody a command or to tell them to drop the weapon, if that person drops the weapon, you have to shut down yourself, your, your adrenaline holster, and maybe give the person hands on. So I think that's an important aspect of, of training and uh, arms qualities to incorporate some of that. Reverend Holwell, anything you'd like to ask? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a few comments. I'd like to make a few comments. Um, and these two comments really reiterate some of the concerns that Reverend uh, Clutter and Reverend Scott have raised. Uh, let me just give a little background, though, about uh, I'm representing the clergy council. 
And we have realized for a long time that community police relationships are very important. And so even before the onset of this pandemic and some of the racial tensions that have arisen uh, over some of the uh, shootings that we've seen over the past couple of months, uh, years ago, we've had the police come in to give seminars at our clergy council meetings. And so uh, many of the clergy in the faith, uh, in the faith community realize that um, there is a systemic problem in terms of attitudes toward the police by many African Americans. And uh, as Chief Willibar mentioned, one of the foundations of having solid uh, police community relationships is trust. And how do you build that trust? Uh, I've done a lot of counseling of people within the church and you don't really see public disclosure of some of the incidents that people actually run into, but um, sometimes these problems are perceived, sometimes they're very real. And so I understand that being a police officer is a very difficult job because even in counseling people uh, within my own community, uh, sometimes we got issues of mental health, you got issues of poverty, people who have had a background of having been deprived over many years. And so they react uh, to situations very differently from, from, from people who may you know, have a well-to-do or middle-income kind of uh, situation. Uh, and sometimes you have people with substance abuse. And so all of those problems kind of wrap into how people react. And so when a police officer runs into, run into a situation where he has to react, it really is very important that the officer have some kind of cultural sensitivity to understand that the problems or the challenges that he's facing with a particular issue may not have to do with a violation, you know, misdemeanor or a criminal uh, a violation. It may have to do with underlying features uh, and characteristics that the officer really needs to understand. So I was really kind of reassured by Chief Willenberg when he talked about some of the training that you go uh, through. But the question is, even though you may know internally that that training is going on, does the public really know that you're having that kind of training? Do they know that you have undertaken that kind of uh, cultural awareness education so that uh, when they run into a situation where, um, you know, you may need a thick skin because the person may react because of their background with verbal abuse or with some kind of action that seems um, uh, assaulting, that you have to have the skill to be able to de-escalate. And so if there's anything I'm concerned about is adding more training to the kind of thing that you already do to be able to negotiate and understand the cultural sensitivities in dealing with, especially African-Americans and Hispanics, so that uh, when the situation could get out of control, the officer, because of his background, will disengage his personal feelings and really look at the situation and say, you know, how do I get this thing under control? How do I bring it down to a level where there's not a confrontation? And if you do that, and you're more effective that, uh, at, at doing that, then you reduce the need to have you know, the use of force. And so the use of force really should be a last resort. And I think that as you concentrate more on um, the negotiating and communicating uh, communication skills that you mentioned before, I think that will help uh, the police department to be able to establish the kind of trust. Uh, and it's not going to be an easy process. I mean, because every incident that gets out of control, you know, word of mouth spreads around so people understand that, hey, you know, I cannot get a fair shake, you know, from this police department. But the more you are able to deal with people, ask people, 
and to deal with situations so that you don't have to use force, I think you build that trust. And so I think it's very important to, to focus on that. No, I, I, I think I agree with everything you said. And what I think what I can tell you is that you know part of the goal of the attorney general in doing these programs is to get the word out so that people do know <clears throat> what kind of training law enforcement officers undergo and what type of outreach programs we have. Um, you know, we we have a, a public information officer who's here today who is advertising, if you will, what we do on a regular basis through social media. Uh, you know, we post activities that we have that, you know, we may be doing an outreach program with a school or with a, a community organization or a church. Uh, we publicize that. We publicize what we do. Um, and many of the police departments do that as well. Many of the police departments do that through Facebook or other social media. They have pages where they expand. I know the, the county chiefs have their own Facebook page where they put information out. And so the information is, is there. I don't know if the best way of getting that to, to the public. Uh, you know, there may there may be a, a, a something that we haven't thought of yet. There probably <coughs> is some way to get that information out uh, in a better way uh, to to everyone in, in the community. But I, I know the attorney general had a program earlier this week, and he made a point of saying, you know, in response to people who are saying defund the police, he says we need more money for police for training, for training, not necessarily for equipment. But for training, I couldn't agree more. I think that the programs that Chief Wilver and Chief Knock and we're talking about really helps develop those community uh, relationships. And as, as Detective Laguerre said, when I grew up, I grew up in Irvington. I knew the, the police in my community because they happened to be the fathers of my teammates on the football team. So I just happened to know them and they knew me. That was a fortuitous situation. I was a very shy kid, and I wasn't likely to introduce myself to others. Patrick's very outgoing, and very gregarious, and has that type of personality where he can do that. Uh, but I think that's important. We used we always have police officers coming into our grammar school, giving programs like like we do now. It was it was done on a regular basis. We got to know them, and I think we need to have more of that. I think absolutely need to have more of that. Thank you. Yes, Reverend Scott. I have a question in terms of the training that's made up to uh, Chief Wilder and you. Okay. In the police training, is there ways, are there ways for the police departments to be made aware of persons within the specific communities that may have mental health issues so that you are aware of when you approach a certain matter and this individual is maybe the perpetrator, maybe your sensitivity or how you approach the circumstances will change? Well, that's where we did go through with that, uh, with the clear training. We did that already for cultural and for special needs. Because if somebody, uh, we'll get this out of here, somebody who may be on the autism spectrum, they may present. You get the information? Yes. They may present like they're normal, completely, completely normal, but then all of a sudden something's not going. Like, we have to realize that maybe there's a problem. So through the attorney general direction, directive on the clear train, we're taught to drill down, find out, take a step back, see what's going on. Because if someone just starts walking away from you, maybe they're afraid of um, a, a car. Maybe they're afraid of something shiny. You don't know what's going to affect them. But you're always taught that this isn't even an EMP. When you approach a small child, get down on your knee, talk to them, right? Because you come down to their level, talk to these people. Or maybe if it's somebody who's hearing impaired, they may not, they may appear to be non-compliant or non-cooperative, but they can't hear you. Same with somebody who's in a drug-induced psychosis. Maybe because whatever drugs they are taking, that is taking control over their body, and they still can't comprehend what you're doing, what you're asking them to do. So we went through all this training. I mean, with our CAD system that we have, is we get alerted to where there may be something like uh, smart 911 in the county. Now, I urge anybody who knows somebody who may have mental health crises or challenging special needs to sign up. So when somebody files 911 in the county, that information is there. The officer pops up on his cat screen. 
says, you may be dealing with something that's a little bit out of the ordinary. You know, trust me, the officers all know. They talk and say, hey, we had a problem over here. And they're like, well, I didn't get through. How did you get through? Right? If it's possible. You know, and then you bring up, find a common ground. You find that common ground and hopefully we can walk without something that happens. Well, I think that kind of information is vital to the general public so that they can, in circumstances of the nature where they're or circumstances where individuals may be challenged, they can communicate with the police department and say, hey, maybe go um, to such and such house, person there may have some mental challenges. And here again, the sensitivity of the police officer will kick in. Sometimes the police officer doesn't know, and the public doesn't know that they can communicate that to the police officer or to the police department. We've had residents come in and say, I have somebody who's special needs. And you know, maybe 20 years ago, all right, what's that supposed to mean? But now, it's not, we need to be aware. Because you want somebody, you know, it would, is if, you're, if your father or mother has Alzheimer's or something and wanders off, you want to know about it. You don't want to have, you know, three little ones knocking on the door. Now, we would rather help you get everybody back to normal as soon as possible. As you were saying, sir. You know, most of the time when we interact with people, most people don't see police officers until it's a car stop, a motor vehicle stop. They were doing something wrong, right? That's usually the first interaction with somebody, with a police officer, or when they're have, suffering a personal tragedy, or they got in a little dispute with their wife or a neighbor, and the police officer shows up. That's the first time a lot of people get to see, get to see who the police officers are in that. And that interaction can be difficult. They've been there, because that can set the tone from then on out for their interactions with what they perceive to be stuff all the time. So again, getting people in the schools, getting out on the streets, walking around, lets them know that we are also human. Criminal Howell, I just wanted to interject real quick. I'm one of the mental health training trainers for the county. So we do train the officers how to identify individuals with special needs. Now, this recently happened while I live at one of my neighbors have an older child that's autistic. I told her, don't you go to the police department, let them know you have an autistic child. So all the cops know who this child is. So if he's wandering, a cop could reach out to a cop in that area to find out if he's supposed to be where he is, he is at. It's important that you do that. But we do train the cops to try to identify with those with special needs. We do do that. Uh, just, just to reiterate, we, we did receive training uh, from the prosecutor's office for uh, de escalation uh, training. So, I think it was part of the, the, the career issue. Um, additionally, we did, uh, on your advice, we did put out a uh, voluntary uh, sign up database for any resident town who may have a special needs uh, family member. It's completely voluntary. They register with us and it's safe and populates on screen if, if uh, the officers are responding to that area. Uh, it would populate a lot of members, especially in this uh, resident uh, area. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Megan, do we have any uh, questions from the viewers? Yes. Um, some of them might be a little repetitive, but uh, I figure I might as well put it out. Okay. After 20 weeks of academy training, how many hours are mandated per year for officers? For what type of training? Um, Use of force? Um, yes. Do they include mental health, substance abuse, or cultural com uh, competence training? I think that we already addressed the clear, clear training is now mandatory per the attorney general's uh, directives. So that that is ongoing a annually. I forget how many hours. Rocco, do you remember how many hours of clear training are required? Three credit hours. Three three hours of clear training. Clear training. We're just clear, and that's a cultural diversity uh, type of training. That's just part of it. And the use of force is twice a year, um, but and it's usually in conjunction with firearms training. Firearms training is what five days. Five days. Five days on the range every year, and the use of force training is done usually in conjunction with that. Uh, I know that most departments I've worked with do them together. Uh, and it's more of a, a lecture and uh, program based upon the Attorney General's uh, guidelines or directives, I should say, and policies on use of force. 
That's like an annual. Yes. Well, that no, that's twice a year. They qualify with the firearm twice a year, and they get the use of force at the same time. So it's twice a year. At the academy, we hosted uh, CIT crisis intervention team classes. They were forty hours, and we did at least two to three of those each year. And the interesting mix of that was there were thirty people allowed in the class, filled up every time. <coughs> 10 of whom were law enforcement, 10 of whom were mental health professionals, and 10 of whom were social workers. It was, a, it was an extremely good mix. It, initially, the first day, like any, any other class, was, everybody was a little apprehensive. But by the end of the week, everybody had a, a, a much better understanding of each other's role uh, with the mental health uh, people that we deal with. I know that one of the attorney general's goals is to have formal crisis in intervention training uh, universally throughout the whole police departments in the state. Is the county implementing standardized reporting for use of force incidents? Well, I'll defer to, to uh, AP Leo on that one. <clears throat> we, there's a new initiative being implemented by the Attorney General, wherein the incidents are reported as soon as they happen, but it's a, instead of just a yearly event, it's going to be monitored throughout the year by the Attorney General to see where changes are needed in the use of force policy, to see if everyone is getting the same training and if what type of incidents are arising, which are creating use of force uh, type, and it's not just deadly force. The reporting is any type of force which creates an injury on an individual. And that officer, every officer involved, will now have to fill out a uh, report and a form, as well as a report. And each form is going to identify each individual uh, victim of that use of force. And that's to monitor in accordance with the early warning system uh, to try to see if there is an individual who may need some remediation or uh, intervention prior to something uh, extreme happening. But we're, we're actually in that process right now. My, my assistant is actually putting together all of the use of force reports for every police department in Morris County. So it's not just the, the, the statistics, it's the actual reports are, are being obtained from, from these two chiefs and all the other you know, 35 or 36 other chiefs in Morris County. And all that information is being sent to Trent to the Attorney General. And just, just to add to that, with the new program that will go statewide, but it's in pilot, pilot program right now, um, there is a list of uh, incidents. Uh, it's not exhaustive, but it is uh, lengthy of each incident that must be reported by use in the use for force portal. And that takes out any uh, waiver or any discretion, uh, basically from either town to town, county to county. Uh, so the attorney general gets a full idea of what's going on in the state regarding the use of force by our officers. About, about a year ago, there was a pilot program to have a portal on the website of, I, I believe it was five or six municipalities throughout the state so that people could report directly uh, incidents of use of force. And I know the town of Dover in Morris County was one of those. And now it's being expanded on a, on a greater scale throughout the state. Are the use of for, uh, are cho the use of chokeholds choco authorized? And if so, does it involve training? A chokehold is considered deadly force. So it's under very, very limited circumstances. I'll, I'll defer to uh, Chief of Staff on this one. During the academy uh, training, the recruits go through 40 hours of defensive tactics or unarmed defense. Uh, training. Part of that unarmed defense is um, the, the policy 
the instruction manual, so to speak, is about 120 pages. Um, one of the uh, portions of that lesson is that chokeholds, carotid uh, restriction are strictly prohibited unless it means the life of the officer or someone else. Is there an effort underway in Morris County to better define the wording on justification for use of force? Well, it's, that's a statewide project. That's why we're here today. The Attorney General is revising the uh, use of force policy. So they're examining the entire, I think it's it's eight pages long. It's about eight pages long. Uh, and, and by the way, anyone can get a copy of this. If you go to the Attorney General's website, all of the policies, all the directives, everything we're talking about today can be accessed and downloaded on the Attorney General's website. So you can get the use of force policy. I think we have a link actually on our flyer uh, that allowed you to, to go to that, that and get that information. But it, it's there and you can take a look at it. But all of that's being evaluated. The Attorney General has said that the use of force policy will be revised, will be updated by the end of this calendar year. So all of the input you're hearing here today and from the other 20 counties is part of the process. And if there are areas that need clarification, I would I would urge anyone who's who's reading that, anyone who's viewing this. If they read that, it's only eight pages long. If they have concerns about clarity in that policy, you know, there's there's a, a portal to notify the attorney general with any comments you have. I know, Megan, if you can read that and provide it to people. We couldn't, unfortunately, uh, you know, in our, our current setup, being socially distanced and working in the virtual world, we could not project the PowerPoint simultaneously with the video that you're seeing now. But we do have that link. If you want to provide it to, to people, please. What is being done to proactively address the, the overuse and misuse of force of weapons or behavior by any one officer? Are, are these reported? Well, first of all, there, there's, as, as you heard from, from uh, AP Leo, part of the goal of, of submitting all the use of force information to, to the Attorney General is to flag individuals who may be, for want of a better word, frequent flyers. Uh, in individual police departments, you know, departments can get a feel for officers that may be overly aggressive as compared to others. That's really the responsibility of that department to deal with those those officers. And I'm, I'm sure these two fine chiefs, you know, have a handle on their personnel uh, and are able to do that. When you get into a department, you know, with with like uh, maybe hundreds of officers, it may become more difficult. But when you have instances of use of force that are being reported, as they must be, every incident must be reported. I can guarantee you that the chiefs in this county are paying attention to that information. I don't know if you want to address that either in the chiefs. Um, anytime of, we have a use of force situation, once the reports are done, the uh, lieutenant automatically reviews the video, dash cam video. We, the Chester Township, we do not have body cams at this point, but the dash cam video, if there's audio of it, we do review it to make sure that everything is copacetic. Uh, same thing, we, we have a review, a uh, meaningful review after every incident. Um, we, uh, we just recently received body cameras uh, for uh, safe and transparency, uh, transparency amongst our residents. So we do a meaningful review of the body camera, the dash camera. We also do the early warning system that was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, and we utilize a tracking software um, to uh, alert us or to put up a flag if. Uh, there's a certain amount of incidents per, per officer per year. Uh, what is the disciplinary procedure for those incidents? Couldn't, I couldn't quite hear what you said. Uh, what is the disciplinary procedure for um, use of force? Well, it could be, well, just because someone uses force doesn't mean they're going to be disciplined. The, the situation where someone might be subject to disciplinary action 
would be if there was an excessive use of force. And under those circumstances, an investigation would be done of that incident. So just to tell you how, how it would work, uh, let's say there's a municipality where there's an allegation of excessive force. That could possibly be criminal, potentially could be criminal. If it is, the local department will refer it to uh, the prosecutor and the prosecutor's office professional standards unit will conduct an investigation of that of those allegations. They will then determine through through that process whether or not, in fact, it was rose to the level of being criminal. If it is, we may charge. There's a possibility that we and we have during my administration, we have had instances where police officers, law enforcement officers, have been criminally charged because of excessive force. That has happened. Uh, if not, if we determine that for whatever reason uh, there was not any any criminal act uh, that can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, because that's a standard, we will likely send it back to the municipality for instructions for them to handle it administratively. That's where you get into the disciplinary process. So for the prosecutor's office, we don't discipline municipal police officers, municipal law enforcement officers. That's up to the chiefs in their respective departments, if they deem it appropriate based upon the level of, of what has occurred. So, and every department, you know, has different standards. Uh, there's nothing, it, it's not uniform. It's really, you know, case by case. That's how it has to be looked at. I don't know if either chief wants to address that. Nothing more, just, okay. okay. Maybe I just wanted to add to that real quick. If anybody feels as though they've been violated or use of force was used, used upon them, they can file a complaint with the prosecutor's office or their municipality, whether it's anonymous, an email or call, we're gonna investigate it. Everything is looked at in every aspect. So we just wanna make sure that's clear. Will Morris County implement the countywide citizen accountability review board for use of force incidents? There is legislation right now, um, and uh, I know it just went through a, an assembly committee uh, concerning civilian review boards. So it's it's in the legislature right now, uh, in at, I believe at the committee level in the lower house in the assembly. So it's not something that that right now is anticipated, but I I can envision you know if that legislation goes goes forward, uh, that's going to have statewide impact. It's not going to be just Morris County or Sussex County or Warren County or whatever. It's going to be presumably statewide if that if that were to occur. So I'm, I'm not aware of any any plans except those in, currently in the legislature. Do all towns have body worn cameras? No. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, they're very expensive. Uh, many, many towns invested heavily in uh, mobile video recording systems, the, the dash cams, if you will. Uh, and those have been the standard for years. So, uh, and, and those have, you know, their limitations. Uh, body cams uh, are new within the last few years in New Jersey. I know that there's been initiatives to, to have them uh, throughout the state. Vin, do you know how many departments right now in Morris have them? I'd say at least 80%. Is that many? No, not, not in VRs, I'm talking about body caps. No, I, Morris now has them. It's, I don't have, it's, I don't it's a, a small it's number. Small it's number probably because of the expense. It's expensive. And I don't know if you want to address that, Chief Doggy, you said you just got them. We just received them and um, it says public knowledge is roughly the uh, $100,000 uh, investment by the taxpayers. Uh, but the other aspect that's not realized with the body cameras is the amount of uh, time it takes to harvest that data and share that either with, uh, with the prosecutor's office or share it uh, for discovery purposes. It's very uh, time consuming. Uh, you almost need a full time uh, staff member to to gather that data hours and hours of, of uh, body cam footage. So it's, it's got some, uh, some cons to it. I think one 
part of the con of the body cameras is citizens' right to privacy. Whereas right now, I believe we may have to release body footage or the body cam footage if we went into somebody's house, which I think now we're getting again against somebody's right to privacy. That's one of my major concerns, along with the press that the burden of the taxpayers. Eventually, it's going to come. What are you doing in terms of cultivating an internal culture to combat the effect of unconscious racial bias so that it does not affect how police enforce the law? Sure. Um, again, I think the uh, cultural diversity training could, could only go so far. I would like to see an initiative actually a lot earlier than that. I'd like to see an initiative take place. I, I know with law enforcement, please, but uh, I'd like to see an initiative take place well before that, possibly in the school system, because you, you know uh, the racial aspect of some of these problems that we're encountering is a learned behavior. It's probably learned well before they entered law enforcement. So uh, I'd like to see cultural diversity training uh, increased in law enforcement, but I also like to see it in the school systems and, and well, well before. Uh, they're anywhere near the age of uh, police academies or, or the police department. So, I uh, say increased trainings and then earlier childhood uh, diversity training. One, one thing that we've done is we've done uh, bias training uh, in the schools throughout Morris County. And this is somewhat of a, a you know, a, 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 an advertisement I'll, I'll give right now. If we, we put this out to all the school, school superintendents uh, throughout Morris County, uh, and we've done programs with them, with, with Detective McGare, with uh, Assistant Prosecutor DeNegri, who head up our bias and juvenile units, and they go out to the schools and they do programs uh, for uh, children, primarily in the middle school range and elementary school, uh, to teach them about bias, uh, to teach them about things like bullying uh, and uh, cyber bullying and those things. So we're going to the children directly to try to educate uh, at that level. And as Chief Naga said, you know, when someone's an adult, it may be too late and it's, it's difficult. You know, I, what I can tell you is, and this may be on your list of questions, as someone asked earlier on our panel about psychological testing, every law enforcement officer who's hired has to undergo a psychological evaluation before they get the job. Now, some departments do a better job or some, some agencies do a better job of this than others. Uh, but that's an exam that's uh, pre-hiring. A police officer can spend his 25 year career without getting another evaluation. So unless there are problems that arise to a certain level, it doesn't require another evaluation. And something that we have to be very, very uh, cognizant of cognizant, we have to watch behaviors, which we do, and I'm sure these gentlemen are very observant of, of behaviors of their officers, uh, and sometimes the officers come to us. We have programs throughout the state. Uh, we want to talk about resiliency. I know, Rocco, you're involved in the resiliency program. You want to discuss that, please? I'll defer to uh, ask Pedro. Uh, <laughs> uh, two things. I just wanted to piggyback on what we're doing in the schools. Um, like the prosecutor said, we go into schools, middle schools, and we go over the bias. We go over bias crimes, bias incidents, what's accepted, what's not accepted. We, for the last two years, um, SAP Denegri and I held training for superintendents and all principals in county, in county for the public schools to let them know what the memorandum of agreement means far as reporting bias incidents. Everything has to be reported to us. And we make the decision on whether it's a bias incident or a crime. At that point, we'll defer to the local police department. So the schools in Morris County know. Now we have helped neighboring counties and did trainings at their in particular schools far as the bias incident is concerned. Far as the training, I'm one of the master residency officers in our county where we train officers in the police departments to try to identify if an officer may have a problem, if something's going on with that officer, 
Maybe you have an officer that shaves, clean shaves, clean cuts, sweat away. And in the last couple of weeks, you've seen him coming to work, not shaving, disheveled, shirt hanging out his pants. You may need to, that resiliency officer that noticed that has to pull that officer inside to find out what's going on. And if that person needs counseling, maybe refer to cop to cop. So the state has put certain things in place so we can identify with those officers to get them the help that they need. backtracking just a little bit what is the procedure after a civilian files a use of force complaint what can someone expect well you, you, would you like to answer that chief so once once a, <laughs> once a couple i had the pleasure of being in internal affairs so i could I help answer that question once a complaint is filed the police department sends it to us and what we do in our investigation, if that police department has body worn cameras, we will review the cameras. And let's say the police department don't have that camera. Sometimes people film videos. We'll get video footage from cell phones. We'll canvas the areas for cameras, ring phones in the area to find out what's going on. We investigate every aspect of a complaint. Once the complaint is fully investigated, the person that's make, making the complaint is going to get notification of what direction the complaint is going in. So we look at every aspect of every complaint. And I must reiterate, anybody can make a complaint, whether via email, anonymous phone call, whether it's anonymous letter, we investigate everything that comes through this office. Along those lines, I wanted to say that every police department has a website and on every one of those websites, there's a portal telling people how they can file a, a complaint against a police officer if they feel you know, something's occurred, whether it was excessive force or, or any other type of misconduct. It's on the website of the police department. And as Detective Laguerre said, you can file this anonymously if you, if you choose to. You give your name. It obviously is helpful if you do because the officers will want to interview you and find out what happened. But if you don't want that, you don't have to. It can be entirely anonymous and will still be investigated. Real quick, one second. I just wanted to just um, add another thing. Officers in Morris County have received implicit bias training. And our office also hosted implicit bias training for our employees here as well. For those departments that have body worn cameras, are they mandated to keep them on during all interactions with civilians? And is there a review to make sure they're on? So uh, our, our policy was actually reviewed and approved uh, by Morris County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, you, you, are, you are allowed a little bit of leeway on how you develop your policy, but basically our, our current policy states that the body more camera must be activated at all times other than community policing related events. So, um, if you're uh, driving by and you say hello to somebody, you're, you're not turning on your camera. But any other interaction outside of that, uh, you are required to turn on your body more camera. Uh, additionally, on a monthly basis, uh, sergeants are required to review their officers' uh, spot check, their officers' body more camera footage. Uh, they just select certain incidents. Uh, like I said, it's a spot check. And then the lieutenants are required to spot check the sergeants' body more cameras. Uh, so there is a constant. Uh, monthly review goal for for training and just to just ensure everybody's in compliance with um, that policy and the additional policies that we have. Uh, where can the public find metrics on the types of use of force uh, reported? Uh, the types of force and the outcome. There's a there is a summary that gets published it's not the we don't the actual reports of the incidents aren't released uh, but there's a summary of the type of use of force that was used um, for each department as well as the county um, correct me if I'm wrong chief um, but it's it's not going to give the exact details of an incident it's just 
collect data as to whose force was used and force form was needed to be followed and was filed, and that gives a gauge as to how many use of force incidents arise in each town as well as the county. And not every altercation or uh, interaction by an officer requires a use of force report. The constructive authority, as was discussed earlier, the drawing of a weapon by an officer as constructive authority in, in conjunction with his verbal commands, that is not that drawing of that weapon is not deadly force. Deadly force is that a report would have to be done if that weapon is discharged, even if it misses uh, the target. Uh, but just the drawing of that weapon as the constructive authority, that is not reported under the use of force. Are there meet and greet events with local law enforcement um, in Morris County? So that you can get to well, know your officers? Pre, pre COVID 19, the answer is yes. Um, <coughs> and now, not so much. Uh, Coffee with a cop programs were very common uh, throughout, I guess, the last couple of years. Many departments were running, having multiple ones. I know. Um, I couldn't keep up with them. I tried. I tried to attend as many as I could. I know Morris Township, Morris Plains, and Morris Town were regularly having them. Parsippany was regularly having them, uh, and I'm sure some of the other departments. I see our two chiefs here nodding their heads. They've had them as well. But with COVID-19, you really can't. Uh, you know that, unfortunately. Uh, we have a question that came in uh, in advance. Actually, one of them was already answered. Have police departments in Morris County begun collecting use of force data on their own? Uh, I think we already answered that. Yeah. Yep. Oh, sure. Pretty much have been answered. What are the plans for increasing uh, hiring diversity, including more women? Well, we've discussed hiring and the hiring process. You know, we do outreach. I, I can tell you that within our office, uh, we look at our support staff, uh, and many of our support staff uh, are women, and many of them have uh, sought to become detectives. And uh, you know, we feel it's it's uh, they're capable of making the grade. We've sent them to the police academy. Um, some have been become some of our best uh, detectives. Uh, so there's a process that we have internally for police for for police departments. Uh, you know, other police departments. I can't speak for them. What outreach they have. And if you want to address that, either uh, either our two chiefs. Up until a few years ago, we would actually put a, an announcement out in the local paper, which may just hit the daily record, may hit the star ledger or something like that. And then we started also adding uh, advertising on the New Jersey League of Municipalities website for uh, anybody that's interested in hiring and becoming a police officer. And now it seems like the common trend out there for people who want to become police officers is through a police app. And we receive our applications through there. So that kind of hits everybody in the state, which gives us a, a much more diverse uh, applicant pool. However, lately, it seems like some towns' applicants are down. When I first started, there were 300 people going for my position as a police officer. And now we're lucky to get maybe 30 or 40 applications. It does make it difficult to find good candidates. Can I speak to that as well? Um, there's a, a program that uh, I think a lot of the Morris um, agencies hire from the alternate route program, and that's open to anyone with 60 college credits and uh, various other uh, qualifications. They have to pass a uh, physical training, uh, push ups, sit ups, uh, 300 uh, yard dash, uh, 300 meter yard uh, dash. Um, a mile and a half run and a vertical jump. And that seems to be, uh, those five events seem to be the uh, sticking point with a lot of the uh, applicants. 
but the program overall is where a person that's qualified passes a battery of tests, psychological testing, background investigation, et cetera, attend the academy and sit right next to a hired recruit. Uh, they oftentimes do a lot better because they are driven and more motivated to, uh, to compete to get a job. And as I said, many of the, um, I, I think a good portion of the uh, Morris County uh, agencies hired from the alternate route program. Are, are no knock warrants used in Morris County? Yes. The, the, uh, it's, very, it's a very small percentage of the number of our search warrants that we have. And I, I will tell you that I actually saw the statistics earlier today. Uh, I would say it's roughly a little bit less than 10% of the search warrants that we might have in a given year are no knock warrants and it's uh, rarely done. It's done predominantly for officer safety. Uh, it would be involved in a drug raid uh, where it might involve uh, armed uh, subjects, subjects that we know have weapons or, or gangs. <coughs> in, in our circumstance, bless you, in our circumstance in Morris County, it's done rarely. I can't speak to, to other counties, but that has to be approved by a judge. So, so in addition to the normal process where we submit a search warrant application, if we're seeking a no-knock, uh, we have a higher standard of proof that we have to show to the judge before he'll authorize it. Uh, you've been pretty quiet. Uh, if you want to address that, any no-knock warrants? <coughs> no, prosecutor, we, uh, I think I've, uh, in the last five years, had one no-knock warrant, and it was involving an individual who was, uh, known to have a long rap sheet and was known to have uh, firearms in the home so it was for officer safety um but not that certainly is not a, a typical provision that we would have in the search warrants we use in major crimes this is probably a good time for me to jump in i know there was some uh some questions earlier about uh, uh the investigation of use of force incidents um you know i, I certainly hearing a lot of what what the uh, clergy is speaking about and what the, the chiefs are talking about, about being proactive, building that trust between people. I think uh, uh, one of the gentlemen said that it's so important to build that trust and that confidence uh, in that relationship before you get to the point of a use of force. Um, you know, so sadly, my, my role in an investigation would happen after things deteriorated and there was some use of force. So the, about 18 months ago, there was a uh, new legislation enacted that spurred the, the attorney general to create what's called the independent prosecutor uh, directive, which you know we follow and we are in the process of uh, revising our internal directive uh, for Morris County and our internal standard operating procedures. But the I think the important take takeaway, excuse me, from that uh, directive is that it's important for the community to have trust and confidence after there's an incident. So it doesn't just become a decision that's made in some back room. The prosecutor. Uh, or a detective doesn't investigate and just, uh, you know, the outside world doesn't have any transparency into what's going on. And, and to try and demystify that, um, you know, the directive really has a number of procedures that are in place right from the get-go when there is an officer-involved shooting or a, a fatal encounter with a law enforcement officer. Uh, number one, as the chiefs will tell you, if there is an incident involving death in their jurisdiction, in their town, they are to have no involvement with that investigation to avoid any perceived conflict or any actual bias investigating one of their own officers. So they would have responsibilities as far as far as excuse me, um, you know, rendering aid, uh, make, making sure that the scene is safe and that that the uh, integrity of the, the scene is maintained until the investigators get there. Um, but they're immediately contacting the major crimes unit, contacting our unit. And it doesn't stop there at the prosecutor's level. We have a responsibility to then report that directly to the attorney general's office. And so we bring that information to the regional on-call supervisor who would then review the circumstances we have there and determine, is this something the attorney general should just take over and supersede the investigation from the get-go? Uh, should it be referred to one of our neighboring county prosecutor's offices to be involved? Or is it something where with the attorney general's uh, oversight, 
our office can maintain that investigation or remain in the investigation and, and do that independently and fully and fairly, again, so the community can have some uh, confidence in that investigation. And that investigation is, you know, we talked a little bit, I think it was, uh, Pat talked a little bit about the disciplinary investigation or the administrative investigation as opposed to the criminal. So our focus of the major crimes unit or whether it's the attorney general getting involved, they're investigating where the purpose of that investigation is was a crime committed. So when we're talking about uh, fatal incidents, incidents involving death, we're obviously talking about one of the different types of homicide we have in New Jersey. So murder, manslaughter, um, and along with that goes the, the question whether or not the officer, in this case, acted, uh, had justification. So acted in self-defense, acted um, as they were permitted to um, under the, the criminal code. Uh, so when that investigation is completed, obviously that information all goes back to the internal affairs or for the, for the administrative review. Uh, but before it gets to that point, there's another uh, review that goes on, whether it's our county prosecutor's office or another county prosecutor's office would evaluate and examine those, those findings of that, that investigation again. And especially in cases involving death, there's a presumption that it would be presented to a grand jury. So again, unless the circumstances of the, the death are so clear and I'm going to speculate if you have something on video where clearly someone is holding a gun towards a police officer and threatening to shoot them and the police officer um, has a reasonable belief that they have to act immediately to save, you know, protect themselves. Unless it's it's really a, a clear cut case of self defense or defense of others, there's a presumption that that investigation would be presented to a grand jury, um, and it's not typically a grand jury in the county where the incident occurred. Meaning, if an incident occurs here in Morris County, we would not probably present that to a Morris County jury. We present it to a neighboring grand jury. Again, to further add in the, those layers of of review, that a grand jury is 23 people from the community. So they are evaluating uh, not only the circumstances of the incident, but also it, looking at that through the prism of the law that applies uh, to determine whether or not there was a crime committed and whether the officer should be indicted or uh, whether sharp charges should be declined. So, um, you know, I think that's been a really important part over the course of the last 18 months. It's obviously a work in progress and we're gonna keep you know, working through it but an important part of after there's an incident, kind of remaining, uh, building that trust and that confidence that the community can have in the investigation, that it was thoroughly and, and fairly investigated. And on that on that line, we had an officer involved shooting, um, I think a little bit before that, that time frame, and we notify the, the attorney general per the, the directive in that case, the attorney general said we could conduct the investigation, which we did. Ultimately, the, the case was presented in two parts to two different grand juries. One grand jury, and, and by the way, the, the, uh, the individual who um, was shot by the police officer uh, survived. Uh, once that the, the uh, officers uh, were, were forced to, to shoot him because he uh, pointed a loaded shotgun at them, uh, they they fired upon him. They immediately uh, engaged in life-saving measures to save his life. And in fact, did save his life. Uh, he's currently in state prison. But the the process was that two separate grand juries were were utilized. One grand jury reviewed the issue of the the uh, individual who pointed the the loaded weapon at the officers. A separate grand jury looked at the officers who shot that person. So they were totally separate presentations, different groups of 23 residents of Morris County who reviewed both of those cases and ultimately determined that the police officers uh, fired their weapons uh, that was justified and that the individual who pointed the uh, loaded shotgun uh, was, was charged with attempted murder with two counts of attempted murder, uh, and he's currently in state prison. So that's currently, or not exactly currently how the process is. It's now a little bit more, uh, even more uh, attenuated, if you will, more conflict checks even over and above that. More questions or? Mm -hmm. yes. 
Are law enforcement officers familiar with Bernstein's test prep seminars? If they are, what in, uh, effect yeah. has it played on law enforcement throughout the years? That's for promotional exams, Bernstein? Bernstein's test prep seminars. Well, all I, I, that's, a test, that's a promotional exam for, for police officers who want to get promoted. I think it's, it's known, there, there are others too, there are many others. follow-up on the bias training how long is the training uh what would a course involve and the is it training? internal the clear training i guess we're talking about training. let's say bias i believe the the bias training that we all think was implicit training back in 2018 was somewhere about an hour and a half to two hours of training that was put on by the jersey attorney general's office so this year when we did our implicit bias training, we did it for a total of approximately eight, eight hours. We did it for approximately eight hours. While you're, while you're looking for the next question, this is one thing I wanted to add. We talked about the training of police officers. I know that Chief Naga talked about uh, shoot, don't shoot. Uh, Morris County is one of, uh, I think, a handful of counties that, that has the virtual simulator, uh, which is an amazing device. I don't know if any of you have seen it, uh, but we have had community groups up there. Un un unfortunately, now with COVID, I don't think we can do it. But we've had various groups up there. We've had representatives of the NAACP, uh, state NAACP come. Uh, I know that they were there along with representatives from Noble, from the Attorney General's office, and various uh, community groups. Uh, and it's an amazing, an amazing uh, facility. It's located in the uh, Police Training Academy, and it's a, uh, a circular platform, 270 degrees of video. And there are different scenarios that the uh, trainers can load in. So you're given a uh, firearm, uh, which does not shoot, it's all electronic, uh, but it feels like a real weapon. Uh, and there's a video scenario that runs. And it's very, very lifelike. I have not participated, I'm sure that these gentlemen have, uh, but it puts you through your paces and it's a shoot, no shoot situation. There are, I, I don't know how many variables they could do. I think there were oh, well over 100 different variables and they can change them. They can change them. There's one I remember where an individual uh, comes up to a police, here the police officer in the center of this, one individual comes up and is almost charging at you. And it seems as though this individual has bad intent. It turns out that he's hearing impaired. And he's reaching for a card to explain that he's hearing impaired. And those are the types of things that they present. Uh, there's some that have weapons where they're engaged in, in firefights, real firefights, and there are others where they're not. They also can use, I think, less than lethal as well. They can use uh, pepper spray as one of the, and a taser as well. I think that's an option as well. So that's something, what, once we're out of this pandemic, I would, I would hope that we have the opportunity to maybe show you or invite you uh, or groups to come back to that facility. It's, it's at the academy. I don't know how they how many they have in the state. It's, it's not that many. They're very expensive. Yeah. They're uh, well over a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and they're they're they they put you in the uh, virtual reality. And uh, I've had uh, recruits. Our recruits went through them routinely. And uh, we had some, uh, we had members of clergy uh, come out down to Essex when I was there, uh, members of the press, and uh, they saw, uh, stood in the shoes of a, of a police officer uh, in a scenario. And as the prosecutor said, sometimes they were reaching for a wallet and sometimes they were reaching for a gun. Uh, we had Diane Sawyer do a store down at 
uh, at one point several years ago, and uh, she came out sweating, and she had a real appreciation for uh, for um, what a police officer goes through every day. Split second decision making, <laughs> often life or death uh, circumstances. That it's it's this is the most realistic I've ever seen. So hopefully, when we're able to get closer together, we can invite you to set up that facility. I think these are the types of information that young folks need to be aware of because they make assumptions sometimes. And they don't know the pressure that sometimes a law enforcement officer has to deal with in, in order to make a decision. I think it's about three to four seconds you have sometimes to make a decision whether to shoot or not to shoot. Sometimes less. Less. And sometimes it's not that easy to make that decision. Very, very good. Megan, anything other else? Um, I believe this was answered already, but this is someone who was new to the session. Um, are disciplinary actions uh, quantitatively reported by uh, each department? And if so, where can they be viewed? Right now, the each department throughout the state has a year-end summary. Uh, the Attorney General has proposed changing that, uh, has a new directive. Uh, that is uh, under under legal challenge. So the the current law has been that the annual report is provided, which does not name the officers, does not provide the reports, but quantifies what disciplinary action was taken. I've been here up to what level? I believe it was uh, current one was ten days imposed in more of disciplinary action. Uh, was proposed and which is now under legal uh, battle is they wanted to drop that down. I think it was five days. Right. Or four more. Um, and also disclose the officer's uh, identity. Correct. Um, so that is, uh, that'll be resolved in the courts. Uh, so right now the officer's identity is not known, but the, any disciplinary action 10 days or more would be reported in the annual summary. Hey Meg, before you for the next question, I just wanted to just um, before I forget. So Morris County Prosecutor's Office, we work in conjunction with the Oval National Organization of Black Law Enforcement, and we have been doing the Safe Stop program on how to act, interact with law enforcement. We've done it at the local high schools in county. We've had the opportunity to participate at um, Calvary Church, and what we do is we take the young adults and adults through a safe stop um, situation, a simulated motor vehicle stop. We talk to the teenagers about knowing who to be in the vehicle with. What does it mean to have um, illegal substance in the vehicle and nobody admitted to who it belongs to? So we do those programs as well. We usually do them several times a year or as needed or as requested. So we've definitely been doing that prior to COVID-19. Somebody came in at once and it scrolled. Is there a way, a resource for citizens to learn more about the training that? There's a there's a 261 page uh, manual that every academy in New Jersey uses, and they they describe the uh, what they call performance objectives uh, for the 13 uh, units that uh, every police officer in the state, <clears throat> with the exception of the state police, they have their own academy and their own uh, uh, curriculum. But uh, that can be downloaded uh, from the New Jersey Police Training Commission website. I believe it's njptc.org. And there's uh, tabs, and you'll see uh, basic uh, police officer 
training, and uh, you'll see every uh, every section of uh, and every unit uh, that they are required to learn and be tested upon. Um, some of the tests require uh, more stringency than others. Use of force, for instance, requires an 80% to pass uh, the academy. Uh, some require 70%. Again, firearms are 80% are, uh, and that's shooting 80% in three consecutive rounds of, of uh, HQC uh, uh, firearm uh, testing. That's uh, 60 rounds. You have to shoot at least an average of uh, 80 within those uh, three. And then you have night fire as well, where you have to get an 80 in that. But those are just a couple of the aspects of the 13. Uh, there's a history of police, uh, uh, search and seizure, uh, criminal law, et cetera. That's, that's accessible to anyone in the public kind of get it out. That address and those copies to uh, many of uh, members of the public, attorneys, uh, teachers, et cetera. What process is in place for officers to assess and determine whether or not a person's mental health may contribute to a situation? We, we take them through the, we, we have the training at the academy for all officers through the mental health. We'll have different counselors come in and go over the autism, Asperger's, people that's going through depression. So they are given training on a yearly to bi-yearly basis to help with that. Each police department may do it a little bit more, but for the most part, we do have a training for that. go back to what the ones that submitted in advance. A lot of these have already been covered already. Um, what are some um, most common de-escalation techniques? I think basically the first part is slowing the situation down, if we can. Um, when an officer arrives on scene, a lot of times the call that comes in, it's not what it appears to be. So we may get called for a man with a gun, turn up there is nobody with a gun, or we get called for a neighbor dispute that can go from zero to 60 in about a half a second. So we try to separate the parties, slow things down. And I think the crucial part here is listening, to be listening to whatever you, the complaint is that is being heard. Another part of it is being respectful of people, you know, respectful to their customs, to their cultures. And at the end of the day, let's get talking about what the problem is and get to the root of the problem. Because until we get to that root of the problem, we're not going to uh, figure out, we can't even figure a path to solve their problem. Again, we have the escalation techniques. Do you have anything else besides the communication? All right. Yeah, I said before, 95% of the time, we can slow the situation down. We can bring somebody in. If there is a problem, a mental health crisis, we can call a screener through either St. Clair's or Atlantic Health let them talk to somebody who's a professional about this, or we can have other resources that we can call that are at our fingertips to get the people the help they need. Also at the academy, they offer verbal judo to offer officers and teach them how to de-escalate de situations through conversation. That's also taught at the academy. Prosecutor, yes. can I say something? Yeah, of course. Um, a lot that we've been saying here has to do with individual programs and initiatives and um, policies and 
the kind of on a micro level. And I think that's really, I think that's really helpful for our people to, to hear this because I've learned a lot by being here. But I just want to say that, and I think I'm speaking for the community, that right now we are in the midst of a huge macro problem. And um, as you all know, I mean, things are crazy right now from, from, from Portland, Oregon to uh, New York City. And some of it has to do, a lot of it has to do with the law enforcement relationship with the, um, the uh, community. This, we are in the middle of a, I mean, I don't, I'm not being melodramatic, but a, a revolution um, with race at the center of it. Law enforcement is one aspect of this race issue. We have to deal with it in church, you got to deal with it in education, and politics, on and on and on. Um, and I often tell people at church that it's impossible to change the world, but it is possible for you to change your world. And I think that one of the roles of people who are in leadership in law enforcement has to be conscious of the, the times. And this is, this, the times we're in right now are times of both opportunity and challenge. And the opportunity is here for, you know, you guys who are in leadership of, of law enforcement. This, this race issue at the center of law enforcement and the community is not going away. You know, I, I tell the people in the community that both sides have, have, have responsibility here. And I was just talking to someone about this before I came in here. There's responsibility on, on both sides. But this race issue is right in, in the middle. I mean, sometimes when I'm, when I'm driving uh, across Route 10 or up, up, up Route 10, going through Randolph, whatever, going on Speedwell through Morris Plains, and I see a cop car. And someone sometimes they may get behind me. They may have nothing to do with me. Maybe they're going someplace else, just happen to be, be behind me. There's this automatic tension that I get. And I'm I'm a pastor, I'm 55 years old, uh, educated, all that kind of stuff. I can just imagine my son, who was 21, 22, 23, who um, you know, may not have all that going on for him. There, there is a sense of tension that you feel that even if you didn't do anything wrong. You felt like okay, they're gonna find something wrong that I that I did. Um, you have to know, and the officers who work with you or under you, that that's the kind of mentality and context that you're working in. And so, um, this is bigger <coughs> and broader than individual programs and this initiative and that initiative. The, the charge and the challenge that I'm going to put out there, I don't even know if it's, if, if it's my place to do that, but is, to, um, is for people who are law enforcement leadership, is to examine the role that race plays in policing. But this conversation with the officers, the people you talk to, just real, bold, honest conversation about the role that race plays in policing. And that's just kind of, you know, I just want to get that off, off of my chest. Again, we are in the middle. This, I, I, I never thought I'd see all this going on in, our, in, 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 in the country in one year. This is, this is crazy, but I think, it's, I think it's a great opportunity, but I also think it's challenging, it's um, upheaval and all that. And all we can do, all you can do is start with your world, whether it's Chester or Longview or wherever. It's impossible to change what's going on in Portland, Oregon. On and on and on. So I, I just wanted to say that because this is bigger than that program, this initiative, uh, this, that, and the other. This is crazy right now. And you gotta ask, we gotta ask ourselves, what can we do to contribute to um, dealing with this big problem of race that's in the middle of policing? Thank you so much, uh, Justin. I think what we do is continue to have dialogue, continue talking. And, and you know we've had multiple conversations. We've had you know, team talk sure. programs, uh, which I thought were outstanding. And I've heard, you know, from the perspective of young people, very similar sentiments to, to what you expressed. And I think the police officers need to to understand that and appreciate that. You know that there are so certain cultural differences 
that, that cause people to react differently based upon those circumstances. And I, I, I unfortunately, that, that's true. Uh, but I think the only way to try to dig down into it is to keep talking and all sure. people, you know, we're all people, we can all communicate with each other. And, and that's why I appreciate so much your, your participating here today. Um, I don't think we're, we're, we're almost at the end of the program. I can't think of a better way to end the program than the remarks that, that you made, Pastor. I don't know if either of you gentlemen have anything you'd like to say. I appreciate it if you did. If you, if you don't, that's okay as well. I think we're just about at the end of our time. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the My pleasure. Thank you so much. Chiefs, thank you so much. I know everybody here is busy. I know we've all got uh, you know a million things to do, uh, you know, with the, the our own lives and with our, our the virus and you know it's such a unique set of circumstances. But I think by continuing to talk to each other, hopefully that we can put some of these problems uh, behind us or at least work on, on doing that. So thank you. And thank you for everybody who's who's been watching. I appreciate that. Megan, do you want to give the portal for the Attorney General? Actually, it's on the presentation uh, in front of you. Okay, what do you want me to do? Uh, to read off the URL. Ah, here it is. nj.gov slash oag slash force. I don't know if you can either zoom in on that or not. If not, that is the portal uh, for the Attorney General's office to submit any questions, comments, complaints you may have on the issues that we've been discussing today, primarily on the use of force. Okay? All right. And thank you everyone again. And uh, look forward to a Calm and peaceful weekend, I hope, everyone. And thank you. Thank you, everyone.